Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome back to Machine Dreams. This is the show where we slow down AI long enough to ask really important questions about what it's really doing to people, systems, and the decisions that affect all our lives. My name is Kalawale Samuel Adebayo. I'm a technology analyst and Forbes contributor. And as always, I'm joined by my remarkable, fabulous co-host. Hi, everyone. I'm Leah Stern. I'm a global communication strategist and venture capitalist. Hey, Sam, how you doing? Uh, I'm great. Excited about today's uh, podcast, especially because we're talking about AI, digital health, you know, and how we can save people's lives, literally. <laughs> We're joined by Moshe Barrel. He is the CEO and co-founder of Aculine. Aculine is transforming the early detection of coronary artery disease with Cora. It's a clinically validated non-invasive platform that delivers accurate results in just four minutes. Heart attacks are the number one killer in America and actually globally. So this tech could, couldn't have come at a better time. Thank you, Moshe, for joining us. All right. Thank you for having me, Leah, Sam. Thank you once again. Um, before we get into the technology or, you know, healthcare system, I think I want to start with you. And I think this is pretty um, important to ask. What was that moment in your career where, where you actually realized that the way we diagnose heart diseases today just wasn't good enough? Well, you know, that's a, a funny story. I've been working in the cardiovascular space for the last 20 years, a little bit more than that. I started at Johnson & Johnson. And I spend every day at the cath lab, seeing people with heart attacks being treated in the cath lab with coronary angiographies. And it never occurred in my mind, even that my father had two heart attacks at a young age, that family medicine doctors don't have any tool in their hands to diagnose patients. There's nothing that they could do on the spot, on the primary care setting, or even cardiologist to differentiate between those patients who have coronary artery disease, the cause of heart attacks, and those who don't. And only when I met the other co-founders of Aculine, which back then we got together by uh, a chance of another VC uh, bringing us together, it occurred to me the potential of this technology. And this is why I decided to leave what uh, I was doing back then and to ask the founders to join Anculine and to lead uh, the company to bring this technology to life. And and it's weird because I've been into this business for over uh, two decades and I never thought about it myself until I was presented with a technology that could do that. And very curious on how the technology works because in just four minutes, it can accurately diagnose. We all know AI has sped things up extremely. Uh, how does it work? So we have developed Cora. It's a system which measures a um, four minute, as you mentioned, Le Leah, a sedentary exam. The patient is sitting in the um, uh, clinic of the doctor. You don't need to be a doctor to operate the system. Any uh, nurse practitioner or nurse or technician can do it. It measures a um, the electric activity of the heart using five ECG electrodes, one on each limb and one on the chest. A, pulse oximeter, SpO2 pulse oximeter on the figure, which everybody knows. And we measure also the respiratory phase using an elastic chest band, which is placed over the cloth. To that coupled with the patient's uh, clinical data, risk factors actually, if he's a smoker, diabetic, hypertension, obesity, and other risk factors and symptoms, all of that is being uploaded to the cloud where our, our algorithm enhanced by AI or powered by AI, does the calculations and provide an immediate assessment to the physician if that patient has or don't have um, significant coronary artery disease, meaning at least one lesion with more than 70% stenosis in one of their coronary arteries. So powered by AI, that's perhaps a very popular phrase by now. If I, if I got a dollar for how many times I hear that in peaches and and videos that I watch, I probably will be a million dollars now. So AI is everywhere in healthcare decks. Where is it genuinely delivering value today? And where is it still mostly just a promise? Great. So th that's a great question. 
So when my founders, uh, two professor, one of computer science, the other cardiologist started working on this idea, it was 20 years ago, way before the AI, uh, you know, was born and, and being used as it is today. They had a notion, they had thought about how to detect coronary artery disease based on several biosignals. And they started playing with this idea and developing it and doing some proof of concept clinical studies. And they have developed a very basic algorithm devised on, uh, I would say, a new way to acquire signals, not like traditional off-the-shelf EKG or SpO2 um, um, sensors. And also they have found several biosignals which correlate between coronary artery disease and uh, the electric activity of the heart. But with the improvement in AI, what AI allows us to do, and especially machine learning and even more than that, deep learning, is when you do a clinical study, you can't do a clinical study on 1 million patients. So you have a small uh, set of patients, but you can enrich it using d deep learning algorithms, which could take each patient's data and slice it and dice it and really try to find things that you cannot do with regular algorithms or regular human being looking at the data and coming up with ideas, which is called features. So trying to find new features, trying to understand which features in the data correlates with the indications that you're looking for, in our case, coronary artery disease, the machine does it better than us. Hence the machine learning and deep learning when you use neural networks basically works like the human brain with uh, neural networks, you could put in small amount of data and still extract okay. valuable information. So for us, it's an enhancement of the basic science that w we worked on or my colleagues worked on for the past um, 20 years, but it, it's not solely the AI. So it's not a buzzword for us. It's not something that we say and promise. No, we actually use, we use AI architectures. And it's important also to say this, Sam, AI is not like the off the shelf product that you like chat GPT, you put in something, you immediately get a result. We have a team of data scientists working to design it. So when we say AI, AI is a tool, but there's still a person designing it all the time, adapting it, making sure it works according to our needs to design it better to what we wish to uh, find out. So it's not off the shelf black box where you just give the data to the AI from the clinical study and you tell them, all right, give me the results. It doesn't work that way. I, I thought it works that way. And and when I came to, to learn, because I'm not from the technical side, I'm coming from the business side. And when I met data scientists and we have a few of them here in, in Acoline, I see how much work and time is spent into designing the architecture of uh, those tools that we all loosely, as you said, call AI, but it's really, really complex and, and diverse. And there are so many tools out there and there's so many things that you can do. And you have the Gen AI, we don't use that. We use other modalities of that. And uh, for us, it's a great tool because it makes things easier, faster, and more efficient for us to process data. And obviously, at the end of the day, to enhance the accuracy of Cora. Masha, you've been in the digital health game for over two decades. Tell me, what countries are adopting this technology in digital health the most? And who's the best at it in developing these types of companies? Okay, so um, as you mentioned correctly, I have a long uh, time experience working globally uh, in different global companies, um, including Johnson & Johnson, Luminous, and several startups. Most definitely the U.S. is the early adopter, uh, especially in the cardiovascular space, which is the space that I'm working in, in adopting digital health solutions. Uh, even though the U.S. Uh, healthcare system is highly complex, uh, and very difficult to understand, it is yet uh, the one who knows how to um, understand the value of new technologies. And sometimes new technologies are not valuable and they won't be used, but when there is a valuable technology, the U.S. healthcare systems know 
um, how to adopt it, uh, whether on primary care or hospital level, much more than the European. They are more conservative. And also it comes down to business models. It's sometimes difficult to embrace a digital health solution, which is based on recurring revenue models. In the European uh, Union, it's more difficult. It's, it's different and definitely more so than uh, Southeast Asia and um, other geographies. Um, I'm not objective, but I would say that Israel is leading in the uh, digital space, um, maybe alongside, of course, the U.S., but uh, outside the U.S., de most definitely that Israel is a leading power in developing uh, healthcare uh, solutions, uh, digital healthcare solutions, diagnostic, therapeutics. Uh, there is a huge um, ecosystem here in Israel. Um, I've been part of that for many years. There are many companies. The, the Israeli health system is completely digitized. Is that correct? Well, for many years, so. Uh, they were one it, of the it, first. Yes, the, the Israeli HMOs, uh, actually the biggest HMO in Israel is one of the biggest in the world. It has uh, several millions of uh, patients under its wing, uh, and it's been digitized for a long time ago, and Israelis are uh, early adopters. Uh, we like technology in all aspects, healthcare being one of them, and a lot of new technologies are uh, adopted here. Obviously, we require CE or FDA, but most of the a lot of technologies are being developed here and being evaluated here. Um, I could tell you that the the second biggest HMO in, in, is one of the shareholders in Anculine, and we got access to their hospitals and their to their clinics. So it's really uh, because of the, the the size of the country, we're a small country, uh, very close to each other geographically. So it's very easy for us to uh, set uh, in motion processes. It's a very short closed loop that we can, we can get a feedback from the hospitals it's half an hour drive one hour drive you're crossing the state so it's really easy to be at the decision makers the stakeholders to get their opinion go back to the blueprint change something go back and redo it so that alongside with the entrepreneurial i would say uh attitude that we have here uh and the opportunities that we have here uh, israel is re really leading uh and paving the way in digital health you talked about um, the AI systems that you use being actually built by human beings. And I think that ties back into the general conversations about general conversation about AI or humans in the AI loop. My question to you would be, especially since healthcare is such a regulated space, how can companies prioritize human beings being behind the machines or AI systems um, that they're using? That, that's a, another good question. So AI, as, as we said, it's a big word, right? And everybody's scared of it and you want to know what AI is, and especially FDA or regulatory bodies, they want to know what is this black box or this algorithm. And we need to differentiate. We need to differentiate between AI, which helps to build an algorithm, but then it's frozen like what we're going to do in Acula. We're going to use AI to bring an accurate algorithm for the detection of coronary artery disease. We're gonna submit that to the FDA. Once we get an approval, we're gonna work with the same algorithm until the next time we, we will have a better and more accurate algorithm. And then we would submit that to the FDA. Our algorithm is not learning anything from the field. And this is what the FDA or other regulatory bodies are afraid of, those AIs, like ChatGPT, uh, who are constantly learning. So there is a feedback from the uh, field, from patients who, is, who are teaching, training is the word of the algorithm, and then the algorithm is learning something, and the output of the algorithm is dependent on the input. But you know what they say, garbage in, garbage out. So sometimes if you don't train the algorithm correctly, meaning you won't have diversified population in it or gender uh, uh, diversity in it or, um, you know, the number of diabetic patients in it. We all know that diabetic is a big uh, problem. So the algorithm would be trained on a biased population. So the output would be also biased. This is the type of AI being used, uh, being more concerning 
for physician healthcare services and obviously regulatory bodies. Uh, but that's different. That is something else. And I don't know of a lot of technologies being approved by the A FDA because of those concerns. And in our case, AI, deep learning, machine learning is a tool. Just like, you know, you go and you build a device and you use electrodes and stuff like that. You have hardware and firmware and software. We have another tool called AI. You develop the algorithm. That's it. You go with that to the market. There is no concern about it learning and trying to improve itself uh, and then bringing maybe false positives or false negatives because of um, misled um, training. Looking forward, looking ahead um, in five, 10 years from now, what will surprise us most about how AI is being used in the healthcare sector? Well, definitely what we see now with the Gen AI, uh, it, it's exploding and growing exponentially by the day. And we're not, every day we see something new coming from Google, open AI and the others competing with each other. It won't skip uh, the healthcare systems. It would start with maybe the simplest administrative stuff, which doesn't impact maybe patients uh, first and make things more efficient for the uh, work and workflow and of the um, teams. But definitely in imaging uh, and other diagnostics, it would be used heavily, Corop being one of them, but others uh, as well. And also in therapeutics, pharmaceutical bioconvergence, the ability to tailor the treatment to the patient according to their specific symptoms, specific uh, genomic sequencing, specific other characteristics, AI would be able to do that. Without AI, there's no way we could manage such huge um, data. And with AI and with the collaboration of the healthcare systems, because they own the data. So uh, all of that together, the industry and the organization is going to be something that we think we're going to use forever. It's going to be common practice. Um, as a way to draw the curtain on, on the conversation, I'm going to put you on the spot. What is your biggest myth? What, what would you say is the biggest myth about AI diagnostics today? The biggest myth? Um, well, I think that people are, you know, relating from what they know of AI being the chat GPTs, uh, the, the, the things that we work on a daily basis to write an email and, and they think that it would work the same with a medical device or a medical technology or a digital health solution diagnostic. It's not like that. Uh, you need to validate everything that you're doing. You need to do a clinical study. You need to spend years into research to have data scientists working on that, modifying and reworking all the time. There is a lot of research behind it, which it doesn't come to play like uh, writing something, getting a feedback. It's not like that. And uh, it, it should be based also on a lot of um, research and science. So AI is something which is a lot of people, again, we said a lot during this conversation, people use that phrase a lot, but they don't really understand what it means. And it means a lot of things and they're not the same. Uh, so I see AI being used a lot in the future, much more than it being used now these days, especially in primary care, which is the gateway to all healthcare services, uh, but it's not magic. It's not you present yourself to the physician, he clicks some things in the computer, and then he knows everything about you and can fix you immediately. It, it doesn't work like that. There, there are going to be years of research uh, into every tiny little indication and every little thing you want to say about that patient's health. Diabetic, then you would have an indication for diabetic. Hypertension, something for hypertension. Each of them is, is years of research. But within a decade, definitely, there are going to be so many more tools out there improving our lives. All right, guys, um, it doesn't work like that. So thank you so much, Moshe, for such a great, exciting conversation. This has been insightful. Of course. Thank, thank you, you for so having me. Thank you to everyone listening. This is Machine Dreams, where we peel back the noise and get to the real conversations around AI. If you enjoyed this, subscribe, share with someone you love, and stay tuned for our next episode. Bye for now.